Urban regeneration, which goes back to what I was saying about placemaking. Urban regeneration, which goes hand in hand with uh, the current government's um, northern powerhouse agenda. I think put into sharper focus by the Brexit vote, where we found a country divided by age, divided by wealth, and divided by geography. If we're going to move towards a better, more unified country, we are going to have to spend much more time on the agenda of uh, creating wealth, uh, creating, and when I say wealth, I don't mean just financial wealth, I mean cultural wealth across the country. So, urban regeneration, it doesn't matter whether I talked to you about the Lowry, which was there as an art centre in Salford, long before there were major employers and all that development around the waterfront. Or well, I could tell you about Gateshead with the Sage in the Baltic. I could tell you about Margate with the Temple Contemporary. Or I could sneeze like the gentleman in the front row. <laughs> Bless you. Um, there are legions of examples where arts and cultural institutions lead urban regeneration. Where they have the potential to change the confidence of a place. Where people think differently about the place they're in. And that's certainly been the case with Mar uh, uh, of Margate, which is one of those very depressed seaside towns. Um, so that's the holistic case, and that is what we've gathered the entire arts and cultural community around as a coherent case for funding of arts and culture. And one of the things about it is it isn't just everywhere you go splurge all that stuff out, like I have done this morning. It's about being discerning. It's about tailoring the argument. It's about seeing, as we all know, potential person, organisation, company, trust and foundation, is going to give money to arts and culture, they're interested in it. What do they want to do? What are they interested in furthering? What are their criteria? Select from that holistic case the pieces of that argument that match the needs of the fundraiser. Uh, one other small detail, it should be true. You are, you should be <laughs> delivering on that. I think that's worth saying. Now, um, I think arts and culture has a particular opportunity in the field of children and young people. As I noticed in the statistics that came out from, again, was it CAF UK? I think it was, um, in the last few weeks, that children and young people had overtaken uh, medical and health as the biggest category, raised, uh, if, you know, divided into segments, the biggest category. I'm right, yeah, and it was Cathy K that did the numbers. There's a gentleman there who understands statistics. I may come back to you later, sir. Thank you. Um, well, that's a huge opportunity because arts and culture is connecting with children and young people, as I indicated earlier, in their millions. And if children and young people is going up the, um, if you like, the barometer, or, or, or going up the, uh, is, is, is growing in importance to fund givers, to even give money, then I, I would suggest arts and culture is very well placed to take advantage of that. Um, I need a, I just let me give you a couple of very small examples. The Royal Shakespeare Company is a brilliant place that has great Shakespeare productions in stratford one avon and many of you will have been to them. But I wonder how many of you know about the fact that they record those productions on video and they pipe them into schools and when they do that, they do it in segments with a hosted uh, a, a presenter and a director talking and introducing each segment of the play so that it's sort of bite-sized and kids get together in school gyms and what have you and I've sat with them and watched and when they do one of those transmissions, there are about 450,000 school children simultaneously around the country really enjoying Shakespeare. Shakespeare, our greatest cultural gift to the world. Part of our national identity. Part of our wealth. Something that no child should miss out on. Not just because we say it's special, but because it self-evidently is brilliant, Shakespeare the breadth of humanity. There's a lot we can learn from Shakespeare today. So that's one example. Another example I just wanted to mention was our In Harmony projects. You've um, heard of those orchestras in Latin America called El Sestima. The In Harmony really follows that principle. 
We all know how inspiring it is to sing in a choir or to play in an orchestra. And this takes children from disadvantaged backgrounds and gives them that gift, a gift for life, to enjoy music and to enjoy it professionally. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a few other points. Oh, wait, anybody want to ask anything? Yes, I, I <coughs> would actually. Um